Imagine that you cannot see. I guess you don't need to imagine that part. But do not fear, it's going to be an illuminating journey. Picture the scene. You're on the way to the local playground with your youngest child. You're slowly walking down the street. Her hand is nestled in yours, the other clutching a lollipop. It's a summer afternoon. You feel a light breeze. You hear the angry traffic rushing past you. And as you approach the junction, she tugs at your arm. Daddy, there's no road. Hold on, you say, let me listen. And realizing that the road has been dug up, you feel the sweat, you tense up. It's noisy, you're feeling quite exposed. You, a, a stranger grabs your arm and drags you around the drone of the digger. You're pretty sure you're actually on the road. You hold on tight to her. And as you turn into the park, the noise of the traffic dying, down, dying back down behind you, the soft trickle of water, the smell of luscious summer grass, you can hear children laughter in the distance. Are you okay, darling? Yes. And off she goes to join the other kids. When my daughter asks me to go to the playground, I am grateful for the opportunity to spend time with her. And then I need to muster up the courage. Now, most of us are pretty courageous, but such an experience puts you back. It means that next time, you might just hesitate about going, and as a result, you've just become less independent. According to Guide Dog's charity, over, of the two million people in the UK with uncorrectable sight loss, over 180,000 never leave their home alone independently. A teenager will not visit friends or go to a concert. Someone's mum will be housebound, losing her zest for life. A family might struggle or even break apart. Now, what if we could change this experience? An experience that today is at best about coping, getting from point A to point B to a really positive experience, where you actually enjoy the journey, you feel present in the moment and have a real sense of empowerment. You would look forward to going out. You might even have an ice cream on the way home. We know that experiences is not only about ability, can you manage, but about feelings, feelings of anxiety, of fear, of joy, confidence. What happens when you peer into feelings? I wasn't always blind, even when I couldn't see a prettiest girl in the party, I wasn't really blind, I had very good friends. But <laughs> Seriously, uh, I was born with a genetic eye disease that meant that I could expect to gradually lose my sight. I remember trying on my first pair of glasses at the age of five, and I said to my mom, let's go outside. We looked at the trees, and they snapped into focus. It was beautiful. So armed with a good pair of glasses, I transformed into a computer geek. I was in the lab at 6 o'clock every morning before school started. That's how crazy it was. Um, I could still see a little bit when I started my computer science degree. I finished university with my first guide dog and unable to read or write. You can imagine that took a bit of time getting used to. It actually took a good dose of therapy and quite a bit of alcohol. But a few years ago, I came across an ad. Guide Dogs for the Blind is looking for a new trustee. They needed an IT strategy guy. Great, I can do that. They wanted someone with a management experience. OK, good, I have that. Ideally, a guide dog owner. Perfect. The only catch, I had no idea what a trustee was. But never mind. <laughs> 
Guide Dogs is truly an amazing organization that changes people's lives every single day. To be honest, until that point, I hadn't quite appreciated how my own life had been impacted by the ability to get around independently and how hard it is without it for so many people. At the time, I was also already at Microsoft. And being a technology guy at heart, I felt very strongly that technology has a very material role to play in independent mobility. We can make self-flying drones. We can peer into brains. We can land probes on comets at the edge of the universe. How do we tap into this wondrous resource, not only the technology, but human ingenuity, to deeply and meaningfully change the experience for blind people. This has become our, tw our quest, the vision that inspired the wonderful group of energizing people from Guide Dogs and from Microsoft and from other wonderful partners in retail, transport, and in city design. And before I share with you some of our discoveries, I want to talk for a moment about design and empathy. And to do so, picture the view that you'd have of a city looking out the window of an airplane cruising at 30,000 foot. You see the buildings, the parks, the roads, the hustle and bustle, millions of people on the move, traffic, buses, trains, and as you zoom in, you start to see individuals. Here's an old man with flowers in his hand. Who are these four, we wonder? There's a lady speeding past with a child in tow. Why is she rushing? And here's a blind man with his child. Who are they? Where have they come from? Where are they heading? The richness of it all, the mystery of it all. How do we engage and design for such richness, such personal experiences? How do we ensure we are not cruising at the 30,000 foot altitude, but get right down to an experience that is meaningful and empowering for every individual? The design empathy starts with the individual, with the old man, the mom, the blind man, observing, researching, understanding their personal situations. That's great, but we learned that that's not enough. If you are going to change an experience, you have to feel that experience in your bones. So our team put on blindfolds, and we went for a walk around the Temple area, which is an old part of London, steeped with the history of law, and justice, with narrow cobblestone streets and quaint shops. And one of our guys could hear, he noticed he could hear a fountain from a few streets away. And the echo that it made literally flooded the nearby streets, illuminating the whole ambience of the place. He realized that even when you are blind, the image in your mind's eye is so rich and so far from blackness. That's when he could feel and his imagination went to work. Light up the world with sound. Somehow color in that image in the mind's eye. Layer audio cues onto the physical space around you. So you get a sense for you, where you are. It's a bit like when you step out of a taxi and you need to get your bearings, okay, Starbucks is over there, the bank is over there, the station is back there, okay, I know where I am. So we developed a way to use bone conduction headsets uh, paired with a mobile phone to place words and audio cues in three-dimensional space around you. So for example, the word door would emanate from over there where the door is. 
And the headset is mounted with head tracking sensors. So as you turn your head to speak to somebody, the door doesn't turn with you, but it stays where it should be. And crucially, bone conduction so that you don't block the ears because you can't do that with blind people. My first uh, experience, we stepped out to a landscaped area in front of our offices, and the team put on me a nice big bulky headset, a phone in my hand, a rack sack with a laptop and other electronics on my back. Yep, it was an early prototype. <laughs> <laughs> So I stood there with my guide dog, Trevor, yes, that's his name, and uh, the developer said, OK, Amos, I think we're ready. Can you make your way to building three? Sorry, I said, um, I don't know my way to building three. Oh, dear. Um, OK, uh, well, why don't you try anyway? OK. Stepping into the unknown, I first need to orient myself. So the headset sounds building two from in front, building three from the side, the lawn from behind. That's great. I position my body, swing my arm, and Trevor starts walking. I can hear an audible beacon emanating from the direction of building three. We veer left a bit, we veer right, right a bit. Before long, Trevor stops with his front paws on the step and a huge grin on his face. It was building three, and we made it. It was the thrill of that moment that we knew we were on to something. And one more thing, I had just walked a completely new route, but with my familiar mobility skills. My hearing, my dog, orientation, direction, but it was a new experience. So I might have made it to building three, but to really learn, we had to try this in the wild. So we enhanced the whole route from a house back in Reading all the way to Paddington Station in London. And we enlisted a group of pretty courageous visually impaired volunteers to help us test and refine the experience. Using one of our prototype headsets, they walked down a quiet high street to a bus where they boarded the bus to the train station, through the station onto a train into London. And throughout that journey, they received directional beacons, they received navigational instructions, even active information such as the imminent arrival of a bus. We learned a lot from that. We learned, for example, there's more to the journey than orientation and wayfinding, that calling out an interesting building, or a beautiful scene, or even a sumptuous looking cake at the baker's. It makes the journey more interesting, more memorable. We also learned that when you're out and about, you can't, get, you can't have the technology Get in the way of your experience. Take your attention away from the people that you're with and the environment that you're in. So we designed it in such a way that you really don't need to keep pulling, putting your hand in your pocket and getting your phone out. I'm sure you can relate to this situation. We sincerely hoped that our trialists will say that they enjoyed the experience, that they found it useful, what we heard was different. I felt more aware of my surrounding. I felt more connected, more resilient. The mobility experts from Guide Dog said they looked more confident, they walked more upright. I think that's amazing. And to illustrate the potential, I want to share a story recently a friend of mine arranged for me an opportunity, a weekend, to fly gliders. Now, for those of you who don't know, a glider is a small plane with no engine. And once airborne, and you're released in the sky, silence descends. And there you are, gliding on the wind. It's extraordinary. The pilot then suggests that I give it a try. 
Now let me explain one thing. In order to keep the plane level, you have to look at the horizon. You can't know just by feeling if the plane is flying straight. But what do you do if you can't see the horizon? So the pilot hands me the controls and indicates to me to pull left a bit, to pull right a bit. Each time I try, we go into a, I lose control, we go into a down, downward spiral, and the pilot quickly has to jump in and rescue the situation. We tried again and again, and no luck, luck. I couldn't keep the plane flying straight for more than five seconds. The left a bit, right a bit instructions just didn't feel right. It felt I was still flying blind. So the next day, we tried a different tactic. Instead of telling me what to do, I asked the pilot to tell me what the plane was doing. The plane is leaning 10 degrees to the right, 20 degrees to the left. I will make the correction. And with that added information, combined with my sensory experience, the movements of the plane, the sound of the wind, it, it was a more holistic sensation. It felt right, and we were gliding. And I felt so uplifted and aware and empowered. And I wondered, can we inspire such feelings? Can technology help us be more present, more human? Not only for blind people, everyone. So imagine again that you're on your way to the playground with your youngest child, slowly walking down the street. Her hand is nestled in yours, the other clutching a lollipop. Bus stop to South Road. Flowering Garden. It's a summer afternoon. Jimmy's Cafe. You feel a light Cinderella breeze. in the cinema. Five stars from Gemma. Hi, darling. How about we go to Cinderella on the weekend? Crossing unavailable. Replacement path 20 meters to the right. As you approach the junction, she tugs at your arm. Daddy, there's no road. Nope, it's okay, darling. They are, they are fixing it, but we'll cross over there. Then a stranger approaches. You greet them. Corner shop. Ice cream. Ice cream. You smile, maybe on the way back from the park. And as you turn into the playground, the noise of the traffic dying down behind you. A soft trickle of water. The smell of luscious summer grass. Duck pond. Wide lawn. Playground. You can hear the children laughter in the distance. Benches. A sunny spot to relax. It's okay, darling. We're good. I'll wait here. Okay, daddy. And off she goes to join the other kids. Thank you. <laughs>